glad you're here in worship with us this morning. We're in our encounter series. Okay, and I just want to take a moment because I was feeling a little uncomfortable um, during worship. If you ever see me like over there laughing, it's not like I'm one of those weird charismatic people who gets like the holy giggles, although that is a thing, but that's not happening to me. There was someone up here doing the floss during worship. I don't want to call you out, but please don't. I'm trying to worship. Y'all know the floss, right? Uh, 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 uh. Any floss tutorials? Is that unholy to do the floss? Okay. We're in our counter series, Encounters with Christ, and we are looking at people who are, um, well, encountering Christ. It's the most self-explanatory sermon series we've had thus far. And so we started it off by looking at um, the woman who was healed by touching the hem of Jesus's garment. We then looked at Nicodemus, and he was like, tell me about this born again thing, Jesus. And then uh, last week, we looked at the man who was healed at the pool of Bethesda. Today, we are looking at, I'm sorry, it's hard for me to call it what it's normally, what it's traditionally been labeled, okay? I I go into this whole thing. Okay, so you know in your Bibles, the subheadings and the subtitles are all like added afterward, right? It's kind of what scholars have decided that different passages could be called. And they're very helpful to us. And I totally know why they have labeled it this, but I don't think this passage should be called the woman who was caught in adultery, because she, and it's not a gender thing, so don't get me all, don't get me on that. Don't put that bad juju on me, Ricky Bobby, okay? It, it is not about that. It's just about the fact that she's not the center of the story. Spoiler alert, Jesus is. But if I had my druthers, I would call it, um, I would label this passage, the Pharisees test Jesus. Now, I understand why the scholars didn't name it that, because Several passages before this all have to do with uh, unbelief in Jesus's authority. Jesus's authority is questioned. Jesus is tested. I mean, this is what pretty much the whole book of John is looking at. In fact, the whole book of John is highlighting the authority of the Son. You might remember chapter one starts with, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It says, later he came and dwelt among us. The world did not know him. Even his own didn't accept him. And so John starts out, this is who Jesus is. This is who the son is. This is what he's about. And this is what he's going to do for us. And so we see that throughout John's gospel, Jesus's authority. And here today, this passage in chapter eight is no different. Jesus's authority is highlighted throughout. And in fact, Throughout this passage, we get a sneak peek of who Jesus is, what he's doing, and what he's going to do for all of creation and all of humanity. So as we read this passage, I want you to pay attention to Jesus' physical posture. I also want you to try to enter this passage as one of the characters. Maybe the woman, maybe the Pharisees, maybe a bystander. Enter this passage. If we as Christ followers ever get to a place where we read these passages and we can't put ourselves in that passage, I dare say it's, it's not a good place to be because you deserve to encounter Jesus. So let's encounter him today together. I'm going to read from chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. It'll be on the screen. And don't think I get lost or I get sidetracked. I'm going to do some teaching in between, and we're going to pause, and the passage is going to stay up. So just bear with me. It actually starts in chapter 7, verse 53. Then each of them went home while Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and began to teach them. Pause there. Now, y'all are going to think this is minutia, but you know me as a preacher, and I don't bring up minutia. The words sat down are very important in this. A few years ago, my husband and I got to go to the Holy Lands as a graduation present from seminary. It was awesome. And when I read this passage, I knew exactly what the room would have looked like that he was teaching in. 
and we were in the ruins of this one uh, Jewish temple in the Holy Lands, and there was kind of this long bench along one side of the wall, and at the very end of the bench was a groove where a lot of people had sat, and we, like good tourists, had all sat there and got our picture taken. But that seat was the teaching seat. That was the seat of authority in the room, and that is where the rabbi would sit and teach from. And so this saying, he sat down, it was not like, oh, Jesus got crisscross applesauce, and they all sat around like some hippie commune. It wasn't that. It was he sat in the authority seat. He sat in the teaching seat, and he took, he took his authority, and he taught from there. Let's move on. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and making her stand before all of them, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. Now in the law of Moses, it's commanded to us to stone such a woman. Now what do you say? They said this to test him, so that they might have some charges to bring against him. Okay, what charges? This situation for Jesus is kind of a darned if you do, darned if you don't. Because in that day, only the Roman Empire had the authority to commit capital punishment. And so if Jesus has said, yeah, let's stone her, they could have brought him against charges against him and had Rome crucify him, which we know eventually all happens, right? But not now, not today, Satan, Jesus says. So they could have had that, okay? But if he had said, no, we're not going to stone him, they could have had charges against him as well because he was a rabbi and he was not obeying the Jewish law. So notice what Jesus does, right? I said, pay attention to his physical posture. In the midst of his enemies, maybe an angry mob, stones in hand, have come in. And what does he do next? He bends down. He gets low. And he writes with his finger in the ground. Many a scholarly ink has been spilled, wondering what did Jesus write in the ground. We don't know. I think there's a good joke in there somewhere, but I'm not going there. But Jesus bent down, okay? And he writes. And when he finally straightens up, he said to them, let anyone who is... Let anyone among you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And once again, he bent down and wrote on the ground. When they heard it, they went away, one by one, beginning with the elders. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus straightened up and he said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, sir. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go your way, and from now on, don't sin again. So we don't know if she was actually guilty. The truth of the matter is that the law that was written, the, Moses, the Mosaic law that they were referring to in Deuteronomy, Leviticus, and Ezekiel, it states that there were to be two eyewitnesses who caught the act. Now, I don't know how that happens. Don't go there in your mind because we're at church. But adultery was not a common charge that was actually punished because you had to have two eyewitnesses. It was written. Now, they didn't present those eyewitnesses. Maybe they were there. Maybe they weren't. But also in the law, in all three places in the Old Testament, it says not just the woman is to be stoned. The man is to be stoned as well. And they did not present the man. I don't bring this up to suggest that she's not guilty because we do see Jesus say, I don't condemn you, but go and sin no more. Maybe he's addressing this sin. Maybe he's not. But what I'm saying is, is that the whole situation probably smelled a little fishy to Jesus, but he didn't take the bait. He did not take the bait. Okay, so as you... We're hearing this passage. Did you enter it? Did you maybe more identify with the woman in that position? 
I mean, maybe you know all too well what it's like to be publicly exposed. That is happening more and more to many of us with the, um, you know, the popularity of social media and things like that. To be publicly exposed, whether the accusations are true or not, maybe your reputation never quite recovers. Do you know what that feels like? Maybe she was an adulterer, so maybe the sting of it was true and her secret had been exposed, but maybe she was totally innocent. Regardless, it was an embarrassing situation. I think the word adultery is kind of hard for us to identify with, but if we look at the whole of Scripture, um, Scripture kind of, okay, hear this in the best way. Scripture calls us all adulterers. That's hard. Don't stone me, okay? No, don't come at me, bro. The Scripture calls us adulterers. A word that's more easily accessible, I think, for us is just unfaithful. But whatever, whatever word you like, it's an, un, it's an unfaithfulness. We can look to the Old Testament even, and the book of Hosea is a whole story about a man named Hosea and a woman named Gomer, and God calls Hosea to marry Gomer, and she actually is a prostitute. And you'd think once Gomer takes her as his wife, she would feel safe, she would feel loved and taken care of, but she doesn't. She actually leaves him time and time again to return to her old ways. And what we find out, what we see in this whole book, it's actually an illustration of God and his people. God is Hosea and we are Gomer. And we continue to leave the arms of our, our, um, our lover for things that don't fulfill us, things that are bad for us, things that cause harm to us and others, things that offend the holiness of God and thus separate us from him. And so unfaithfulness kind of comes easy to us. Unfaithfulness is a hard word. I think adultery is a hard word. But if we ever get to a place where we can't identify with that woman, yeah, we might miss the hardship of being exposed and, and the pain of admitting our sin, but we'll also miss the opportunity of standing face to face with a Savior who says, I don't condemn you. I don't condemn you. Go and be free. Be free from sin. Live into the freedom that I give you. And so maybe you heard that story from the woman's perspective. Maybe when you read that story, when I was reading it, you might more identify with the Pharisees. I know that's hard for us, but, but it's easy to see the sins of others. It's much easier to see the sins of others than it is to see our own and to kind of say, mm, Lord, look at them, mum, 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 mum. Y'all remember that from when you were a kid? Mum, 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 mum. And even innocently enough, even in our prayers, we're busy taking the sins of others to the foot of Jesus, taking the sins of others, instead of coming, bringing our own sins to him. Did you notice what Jesus did? He made the Pharisees admit that they had sin by saying, he who is without sin, throw the first stone. And by walking away, by not throwing a stone, they had to admit that they too were no better than her. They were sinners. My husband and I are going through the, the re-engage marriage ministry that we have here at our church, and we're having a good time doing it. It's really fun. Any, any re-engagers willing to throw their, throw their hand up? Hey, oh, re-engage, I see you. It's a fun thing. It's every Tuesday night, two hours, free child care, okay? And we get to hear a testimony of a marriage that has come back together. We hear the real struggles of life and, and reconciliation. And then we meet with our small group. And I love Reengage because they have this phrase that is now a part of our family's lingo, and it's called stay in your hula hoop. And the thing is, and sometimes we'll say, okay, you guys stay in your hula hoop. You come into my hula hoop. But the thing is that 
you step inside a hula hoop, and whoever is in that hula hoop, that's what you can control. And guess what? Only you fit in that hula hoop. The person in your hula hoop is who you can control, who you can change, whose sin you can point out, whose spiritual work you have to do. It's all about you and God. And guess what? The more you stay in your hula hoop, the more you do your work with Jesus in your hula hoop, you become healed. You become more whole. Things in your relationships start to change. Because whereas before, you may have been easily taking that bait for the fight, all of a sudden, you stop fighting everyone and everything because you're doing your work. And you just have to trust that the other person is doing their work, but really, that's in their hula hoop, and that's none of your business. So what does Jesus say to the Pharisees? Stay in your hula hoop. Could you imagine a Pharisee hula hooping? <laughs> I never did master the hula hoop. If you did, you have a, a gift from the Lord. So, you know, you remember how at the beginning of the sermon, I told you, pay attention to Jesus' posture. This passage is really interesting because it's highlighting the authority of the Son. It's highlighting his grand work of redemption and what he's going to do for us. And so whether we are the accuser or whether we are the accused, we get to receive this, this thing of no condemnation that Jesus does for us. We have a Savior who leaves his teaching seat, bends down, comes to us, gets in the dirt with us. And when he straightens up again, he comes out of that grave, he delivers the message, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So this passage is showing us from beginning to end what Christ is doing among us and what he has done for us. It's that rising, dying, and rising again. He could have sat on that seat. He could have stayed in that seat of authority and spoken to them from that throne, but he didn't. He got low. Dare I say he submitted. He didn't take the bait, that's for sure. He didn't square up with his enemies but he offered still that, that beautiful message of go and sin no more because I don't condemn you. You're free. What makes us leave our true love, what makes us move into a direction that is not that which fulfills I think the, what makes us unfaithful oftentimes, I think it looks different for a lot of people, but I think it, it all comes back to fear. It's all a form of fear, right? Like somewhere along the line, we start to wonder, um, am I good enough? And so we do things that prove our, our goodness and our worth. Am I... Am I okay in and of myself? Am I solid? Um, we think, do I have enough? Will my needs be met? If, if no one can meet my needs, I'm going to go out and make sure my needs are met. Am I safe enough? Do I have enough? All of these things stem from a little bit of fear. And then before we know it, ever so innocently, we have moved from our first love into a place of unfaithfulness. And we seek those things and our alliances have shifted. And so if you find yourself in that place this morning, that's okay. We all are in this together. We all have stuff that needs work in the hula hoop. But Jesus is calling to you this morning to be free from that. We don't have to be afraid anymore. We don't have to hustle all day long to make sure things are taken care of. We can stand straight, upright, look into our Savior's face, 
and hear, there is no condemnation for you. Go and be free. Loft, let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we do love you, and we thank you so much that you are a God who left, who left your teaching seat to bend down and remember the dust, to bend down and get in the dirt of our lives with us. God, I thank you that you're present and you're at work in everyone's life here. Maybe there are some of us who are really struggling. Some of us who really know what a life of adultery means and the fallout from that. God, I pray that you would minister to us, those of us who are in those places. Maybe there's some of us who aren't able to really connect with this. But God, I pray that you would connect with us. There's some of us who have a lot, a lot of work to do inside that hula hoop. God, help us to not feel like it's ours to do alone, because it's not. We just have to show up, and it's your work, Lord. It's your work to do. God, I pray that your spirit would rest now upon us. In this next song, as we respond to the movement of your spirit, would we just feel your presence? And even for a moment, would you help us know that we are loved, that we are safe, that we are cared for, and that you are on the throne. You are working in all of us. And I pray all these things in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.